Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us early for this session. We're going to give everybody a minute or two to come on in. But in the meantime, you know the drill in the chat. Go ahead and say hello. Let us know where you're from, what you teach, what school district you work in. We always love to know who's part of our audience. And we'll get started shortly. All right, first representation is Miami-Dade County. Very good. Great to have you here, Mabel. Thank you. Pasco County, thank you for being here. Palm Beach, Monroe, I love it. Great representation for our Florida school districts. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Thanks for sharing. We appreciate it. This is our seventh session, two day symposium. Many of you have been with us for a couple days now. So thanks for writing this out with us. Uh, it's been wonderful on our end. And we really are appreciative of you tuning in to as many sessions that you've been able to make it to. So we're going to go ahead and get started so that we can uh, finish in time. We have a lot to share with you in this session. Thanks for being here again. You're attending session seven, seven, which is educating for civic action strategies for addressing environmental issues of the Everglades. For those of you who attended session six, the value of youth adult partnerships to create sustainable civic change. This is a continuation of that conversation, but don't worry if you missed the previous session because we will be touching on all everything you need to know again in session seven. Make sure that when you're sending your chats, you are sending them to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see what you're sharing, what your feedback is and what your questions are. So let's go over some webinar guidelines for you. The chat is our main form of communication. Please feel free to add your comments, your thoughts, your feedbacks, feedback. Uh, we'll do our best to address all of the questions that we can, whether it's during or after the presentation. And we have some fun, engaging moments for you to participate in what we're talking about. So. Continue to follow us and tag us on social media. On the screen, you have our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter handles. And make sure you're hashtagging. We love to go online and check out what you've been posting and what you've been sharing. Um, it makes us feel like we are creating a larger space for our teachers to be able to communicate with each other and network. So thanks to all of you who've been posting. So your presenters today are Alicia Torres, who is our K through 12 Everglades Champion Schools Program Manager here at the foundation. And we're also joined today by Mrs. Melissa Atkins, who is a incredible middle school teacher at Trade Winds Middle School in Palm Beach County. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Bianca. I am just serving as your host for this session. So I'm gonna pass it along to our wonderful presenters and I hope you enjoy this session. Thanks for tuning in again. Thanks, Bianca. Um, as she mentioned, I'm the K-12 Everglades Champion Schools Program Manager here at the Everglades Foundation. Before I came to the Everglades Foundation, I was a formal classroom teacher for 15 years teaching science, um, anywhere from grades pre-K three through uh, seventh grade in Palm Beach County. Um, I then shifted over to um, informal ed and um, joined FAU Pine Jog and then Everglades Foundation. So. Um, to really focus on environmental ed and bringing that in particular now the Everglades education, which you're here to learn more about. So I'm going to pass it over to Melissa for her to um, tell us a little bit about herself. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, and I'm in my 25th year of teaching, which sounds really weird to say, um, but I've been working with middle school uh, special ed teaching science for the last 10 years. I have taught preschool through adults. And I definitely uh, love using project-based uh, projects in my classroom and um, getting the kids uh, in the classroom, hands-on, dirty, the whole thing. So I think, I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Thanks, Melissa, for, for joining us. And I'll give it a start. I'll kind of tell you a little bit about how this um, civic actions came to be um, and how it's being utilized at the Everglades Foundation. So. We partnered with Earth Force. Um, if you were here in the last session, you learned a little bit more about them. 
Um, they provide professional development and they, in particular, the six step community action and problem solving process. And this combines civic engagement, environmental action or environmental education and STEM education so that the youth can work with their teachers to identify and research local environmental issues resulting in a civic action project um, that, they, that they choose. So uh, we joined and then we then bring this to you guys. You bring it to the teachers, the schools and the school districts uh, then, then partner with our, our students. So, um, so we wanna start first by asking you to uh, answer in the chat, how comfortable are you with conducting civic actions with your students, civic action projects? You can either put the number or write it out in the chat. One, very comfortable. Two, somewhat comfortable. Three, I've heard of it, but not too comfortable. Or four, I don't have any idea where to start, which is all fine uh, in doing that because we know that this is a different, maybe a different way of teaching, right? A different way of the instruction uh, that you're doing in your, your classroom. Great, I see a lot of uh, different levels here. So we're awesome that you're joining us today and we hope that you will find some of these strategies helpful for, for you to use in your classroom. So let's get started. So what is civic action? So you may have heard terms like civic action or engagement, and it's used interchangeably, which isn't incorrect, but basically that civic action is any individual or group that's attempting to improve life in their community by advocating for change. They wanna see, uh, and they're reaching directly to those in power, the ones that are the decision makers. And so when you're applying this into your classroom, it's that pathway to this collective action and system-based solution. And students are given that opportunity to acquire these long, lifelong skills, the tools and experiences that they utilize to become more engaged environmental citizens today, and of course, years to come. Uh, civic engagement as young people equates to more engaged citizens in the future. We know that uh, Everglades restoration is, is in particular is, is going to take a long time, right? The kids that you are having now in your classrooms, even if they're elementary, they may be part of that uh, change in part of that restoration process uh, and adding to it as a, as a young, young person. So the student-led civic action and what, what's important here is uh, these adult, youth adult partnerships that are formed. And, and you're formed to, to achieve a common goal. If you attended session six, we discussed that the youth adult partnership means that the students or the teachers are working side by side with the students and they don't assume this uh, inherent authority position, but accept that they can learn just as much as they can teach in this partnership with, with the students, which I think Melissa is gonna share a little bit about her uh, experience about that too. So. Um, it's a, it's a teacher-led knowledge base uh, pro type system um, to a student-led solution base. So student-led civic action is our overarching goal here. So in, in civic actions, the students are working to make a difference in the civic life of our local communities, like our greater Everglades, which is why we're here, and simultaneously developing the knowledge base, the skills, the values, and motivation to make a difference. So I don't know how familiar you are with the habitat loss of the pine rocklands um, next to the zoo, but we only have about 3% of the pine rockland habitat left. Um, and when I say the zoo, I'm talking about the Miami Zoo. Could you imagine if you had students filing into the office or flooding these decision makers with letters from students that have these skills to advocate for this habitat? It, it starts to make you wonder if the outcome would have been a little different. And this is why it's important to provide these students with the necessary resources and skills so they can effectively do that. We don't just want them you know, running into the office, but we want them to know how to advocate for this effectively. And through this process of the civic actions, the steps that I'm gonna share with you today, it breaks down these, these steps so that they can do this effectively. 
So because I'm a sci science, prior science teacher, I always like to have some type of research, like show me the research and, and why is this important? So research has constantly shown that programs that engage young people in a, actively addressing local issues are more likely to result in the development of the skills, the content knowledge, the motive, and of course, the motivation necessary to be effectively engaged in this environmental decision-making. The, the young people will start to feel motivated and will develop their sk civic skills to um, if they find an issue that they are care about. They, if we tell them what they should be caring about, then what's the point of them having their voice, right? We want them to share what they are passionate about um, because that's gonna really light the fire under them um, to debate issues and find the solutions. Because if we just give it to them of what they are supposed to be, um, find important, then they're going to say, say, oh, well, this teacher's going to also help me find the solutions. But you wanna do this youth adult partnership is kind of a side by side. Uh, Morgan and Streb 2011 have uh, found, or 2001, I should say, have found that student choice is positively correlated with improved self-concept, political engagement. And I feel really passionate about tolerance, right? It doesn't, ha it's across the board. So I'm gonna pass it over to Melissa. Um, and so she can say how her experience, what she learned with developing a youth adult partnership with her ESE middle school students. Like how did the students benefit or you know, did this change your teaching style, if any? So the floor is yours, Melissa. Thank you. So I had two classes of students who worked on this project last year and it's about 20 students in total. And I normally teach using projects and hands-on activity, but I'm always leading those students through the process. And I know how they're gonna to get to that end result. For this project, the learning process was laid out by me. I knew what I wanted the end, what I wanted as the end result, but I didn't know how we were gonna get there. And I didn't know what that end product was actually going to be. And this was really scary for me. Um, I really had to realize how the whole process, I had to release that whole process um, to my students and trust their learning. And as my students realized that they were in control, they really flourished. And even though it was COVID, half of my students were at home, half of them were in the classroom. Whenever we started to work on this project, they were always engaged. They, every kid bought into it. And as um, they continued working and learning more about non-native and invasive plants, which was our topic, they were really driven to learn and to do more. And even though it was really scary, it was totally worth it. And the kids really, really did a great job. Thanks, Melissa. Yes, yeah, she mentioned the word scary. And I like to also think like, it's a messy process too. It could be, it could be both. Um, there's a lot of, um, it might change your teaching style a little bit than what you're used to doing um, as like me, that authority figure in the classroom. So. It's teacher facilitated, right? It's not where the kids are running the classroom, but it's teacher facilitated with student led and you're kind of joining forces to make that share that leadership and responsibilities in your decision making. So how might you get your students to take this action just as Melissa did in her with her students. So here at the Everglades Foundation, we're basing our civic action model adapted from EarthForce, the six step community action and problem solving model that focuses on students thinking about making changes in policies and community practices. And the policies could be, you know, policies at your school or it could be grander policies. It could be ones that are affecting um, a community city or you know governmental and then your i'm sorry your policies and your community practice is the same thing like what your practices are at your school and in your classroom and it could be um, in a greater level with your district so at a glance here are the six steps of the community action and problem solving process it flows this it follows this pattern of explore deciding and then acting so step one is community environmental inventory. Step two is selecting your issue. Step three is policy and community practice research. Four is establishing those goals and strategies. 
And five is then taking plan, planning and taking action. And step six is reviewing and sharing and celebrating your successes. So I don't expect you, I'm gonna, you don't have to write all this down. I'm going to share a resource with you that's gonna break all this down and provide you with extra resources as well later um, in the presentation. So these steps can be implemented in a variety of ways across different subject areas through school clubs, after school programs, environmental clubs, your classroom settings, whatever you can think of where you can get those students together, that's how you can implement this. Um, each step can be easily adapted and modified by elementary grades all the way up to high school. I know Melissa is a middle school teacher and we are working and I'll tell you more about our middle, how we're infusing this in our middle school champions, but it really can be applied K-12. It just might look a little different, right? So um, maybe they're drawing pictures instead of writing it, it, it out. So there's lots of different options there. So in a moment, I'm going to show you a little video sample of a student group that worked from another institute, um, actually with Ms. Susan Toth on this model. Um, this These students tackled the issue of um, biodiversity loss and um, in particular invasive fish species. So they developed, they followed this community action set um, problem solving model to complete their project. They developed these measurable outcomes and created a plan for the longevity of their project. And, and they also started thinking about how this would uh, continue. We are a part of the FAU Pine Dog Fellowship, and we have created a sustainable environmental project after learning about the different issues our community faces. The program has afforded us the opportunity to explore many different topics. One that stuck out to us was the loss of biodiversity, or a variation of species in the area. Specifically, we were concerned about the biodiversity of freshwater fish, and we chose this issue because a Florida Fish and Wildlife Commissioner spoke at one of the Pine Jog meetings about the problems that invasive fish are causing to fish native to South Florida, and we were very moved by this. Invasive fish are not native to Florida, and they are somehow introduced to our waters, usually by humans when they release a pet fish, or sometimes intentionally to stock the water. Um, this is illegal, but it is also overlooked. We want to draw attention to this issue. Before actually starting the project, we did a needs assessment, and we went to local pet stores to figure out how they were selling these invasive fish. And we found that they did label um, where they were from, so if they were from South America, it would say South America, that's their native range, but it did not say that they were invasive to this area and that they could cause harm. A fish species becomes invasive when it begins to compete with native species or damages the environment in any way. Not all non-native fish are invasive. For example, the peacock bass is an exotic fish that was released in to control invasive populations, but there are a lot of invasive fish that you can buy in a pet store, and the regular consumer has no idea that this fish is a threat to the environment, and probably has the intention of releasing it in a local lake when it becomes too big for the tank. Many fishermen and fisherwomen catch invasive fish, however, instead of keeping the fish, oftentimes they release them back into the water. They may not know about the damage that invasive fish can have on native fish populations or the environment, or they may not even know that the fish they're catching is invasive. So we set out to address this problem. We considered hosting a fishing event to catch invasive fish, or opening a booth at the green market, but we thought of something much better. We contacted the widely popular app Fish Brain in the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission to put together our plan. Both partners agreed to work together to develop a feature on their app that will help anglers differentiate between invasive and native species and encourage them to keep the invasive species rather than releasing them. This was exciting news for us, and we have confirmation that it is happening. However, developing an app feature takes time and will be a continuation of our project. We didn't stop there. We wanted to raise awareness of the issue as well. We received confirmation from the community that they were on board with us. We spoke to several clubs at our school, created informational pamphlets to hand out at pet stores, nature centers, and campgrounds, and got pledges for feedback. We received an amazing response from these facilities. 
seven out of the nine locations that we went to agreed to keep our pamphlets available to the public. These places include Mark's Ark, Pet Supplies Plus, Fish Fantasia, Lion Country Safari KOA, John Prince Park, Grassy Waters Preserve, and the Noxahatchee Wildlife Refuge. The protocols that we created highlighted the issues with invasive fish and identified some of the key species to look out for. It also encouraged people to use the Fish Brain app so that when the app feature is launched, we will have some support, as well as using the Instagram hashtag to blog any captions. We created an Instagram page with the slogan, Stop the Invasion to Further Raise Awareness. We have almost 600 followers on it, which showcases the amount of people that are interested or impacted by our mission. We feature people on the Instagram page with their invasive catches that they kept instead of releasing and praise them for helping us. Anglers are also encouraged to use the hashtag Stop the Invasion when keeping an invasive fish. We use Instagram as a community-based social marketing tool to raise awareness about our mission and to gain support from the public. Some obstacles we encountered were communication barriers between us and our community partners. More well-known pet stores like Petco declined our pamphlet, but local stores like Mark's Ark were very happy to have them. We overcame these obstacles by being persistent with our community partners, by calling if needed, and following up with emails. We received 108 pledges, so we know that we have helped educate people about the subject, which helps make our impact even greater. Our Instagram follower account also reflects our support with our mission, as does the counting of hashtag and message posts. We will also be able to measure the impact of the app feature once it is launched by keeping track of how many people use it. The app feature is a sustainable component of our project as it is something that will be continued without needing maintenance. And the pledges ensure that we have people on board and willing to cooperate with this practice. We will continue to update the Instagram page and now are waiting on the app feature to be complete so that we can really make a difference in this project. The pamphlets will be continuously replenished by the Marine Conservation Club. So as you could see that these students that were, these were the students that were leading this charge. So, so let's, how, how do, how do they even get started? How do you do this? Uh, I saw in the comment, like, um, that they love this invasive species, stop, stop the invasive species project. So, but how do these kids get started? So I think at first, you know, this kids will start having a greater understanding of say the Everglades or environment. And they'll start noticing the human impacts on questioning why things are happening. It's a, it's a natural process. So in the first step is taking that next action, right? Instead of wondering about it, then what could they do about it? So we'll jump into um, investigating the community by conducting a series of inventories. They'll collect and make collect data and observations, and then they'll synthesize this information into a list of community strengths and um, and concerns. And from there, they will analyze their concerns and then dig into those root causes. And then they will be able to focus on that action project. What are those strategies? So today, I'll highlight the first few steps of of the six towards conducting civic action projects to get you started and get your feet wet. So as they start this process, um, as the educator, you wanna define your community and what does that look like? So it could be your classroom, your school, your surrounding areas. I know a lot of you have like maybe wetland areas around you or some other Everglades habitats that are surrounding your school. Uh, it could be within your city limits or your, or say maybe pick your whole KOE watershed. It's it's up to you, you're defining this as the educator. So you wanna also focus them. This is why it's teacher facilitated and you're establishing those inventory locations and narrowing your, your focus. So you wanna maybe, uh, when I say your focus is based on your curriculum and your instructional goals. And for uh, Ms. Atkins, her instructional goals were basically to focus on invasive species. So she set that ahead of time, and she'll talk more about that in a minute. 
So how do you choose these inventories? What do they look like? So throughout the action process, the goal is to really continue those strategies that further develop the youth adult partnership between the teachers and students. And this inventory process gives them that freedom to decide what they're going to dive deeper into. So you might have to structure this a little bit depending on your students, but there's different types of inventories depending on um, your focus area. There's, um, but you want to really have your, as an educator, you want to make sure you are still focusing on your academic needs, your time constraints, and um, the location access. So for Melissa, there was some location access issues because of COVID restrictions, right? So she focused on her at her school and then the students that were working virtually at their home. So she was meeting the needs of her, her what she could do as, a, as an educator, but at the same time, she was still um, focused, allowing the kids to do this process. So there are different types of inventories, numbers based, which is collects your numeric data. And then you have your descriptive non-numeric data which are like your surveys and interviews. So, and then you can have students choose them. All right. So here are a couple different uh, inventory examples, surveys, creating a school peer community survey. Um, it could be written, digital or verbal. You have audits and assessments, and this could be looking at uh, carbon footprints, food waste, um, how, how well your systems are working within the community, like habitat diversity or an invasive species assessment. Uh, there's oops, sorry, data collection. Uh, there's reviewing policies and practices, so identifying city and county ordinances um, and using topographical maps. You can interview people, like look at your local experts or persons that are involved in your city planning, administrations, finding those stakeholders. Uh, you can look on online databases and investigate your concerns over that. And of course, getting out in the field is one of my favorites, like getting the kids outside, collecting these samples, um, maybe doing this water quality monitoring and, and so on. So lots of options for inventories. So when you're considering involving expert volunteers, they can help you to explore the scientific evidence and provide that real world experience that gives students a basis for the selection of their single issue. So uh, I don't know if anybody has used um, science in a scientists in every Florida classroom or school, but they're a great resource here. And I think they were a resource also for Melissa. So, and, and experts can be of all types, your businesses, nonprofit, government agencies, and all of them can share a different perspective and, and insight. So at the end of the inventory experience, the students are making a community strengths and concerns list, which you can see here. This is a resource that's already created for you. You do not have to um, come up with your own. This is already something that we are going, we can provide you also at the end in your quick start uh, resource. So they make a list of these strength, strengths and concerns. And then once they have those strengths and, strength and concerns, they reorganize this, use this, uh, questioning technique of five whys. So they can now define what is the effects of these concerns and then what are the root causes of the concerns. So this five whys technique is a, a questioning technique. So maybe you have already used that. I start thinking about like, you know, the little kid that always asks why after everything you ask them to do. And that's kind of what this, this five whys technique does. So they name a problem that they're having. They, you ask, why is it happening? You get that answer. Then you ask why about that again, get another answer. And you continue to do this about five times until they really have narrowed down what is the, uh, the root cause. And by the end, the students will have a list of all these issues that are root causes and have an understanding of these issues 
and make a selection of what they want to focus on for step two, which is is um, issue selection. So they may have more than one issue and that's okay. They're just going to narrow down their, their focus. And so that might take that might take a while to do and it might be a lengthy process and, and that's okay. So they're gonna then take that, that issue selection and start doing some of this research, which is step three in determining what is the policies and community practices around that issue. So students will be more about the policy, in this step, they will be more aware and cognizant of the policies and community practice that are related to their issue. And so just to clarify what these policies and practice, what I mean by these is a policy is a rule or guideline established by people or an organization that's an authority. So these are generally your laws and regulations for general public to follow. Uh, policies that businesses and organizations um, do could be private policies. So you have public policies and private policies. But for example, your school may have a policy for not permitting chewing gum in school. So whether that they follow that, that's a different, that leads into a community practice, but your policy might be in place at your school that there's absolutely no chewing gum, it's written, and um, that's what's established. And for community practice, these are the widespread common accepted behavior. So think about this as the way of doing things as the general habits and behavior of people. The practices are not necessarily guided by a written policy, but in fact, some of these um, written policies are not even enforced. And so it changes these general habits of people. And that's what happens in place. So for example, you might have some pet owners that release their pets into nearby natural areas when they get too big. So what we've seen is the impacts already of that um, in the Everglades, thinking about our issue with Burmese Python numbers. So, so here are some examples that I've had on, on here that shows you the differences. So through this step three, the students will learn who is affected by this issue and, and who has a stake in the issue. So what are your stakeholders? Why do these issues exist in the first place? And you know, that might um, alarm some of these students to find out the rationale of what's happening. And um, the other should be, could be surprised by what current policies are already in place that may not, um, that people's community practices are varying from. So this is why the research part in step three is really important. So, so that the students know where to then um, plan their action project. So, and they also want to focus on, oops, they want to focus on their decision makers that are relevant. They want to talk to those because you might have a lot of people that they will engage that they think they are um, very knowledgeable about it, but they're not the ones that make the decision at, at that location or within your, um, within your community that you've defined earlier. So that's the first three steps, but since this is a six step model, I wanna just go over these a little bit further. So step one is a community environmental inventories. And this is where the students assess their communities for environmental strengths and concerns. And they come up with a, a list of this inventory, right? They're collecting data here. This is where they develop the awareness of the importance of taking public action in their community and how their roles are playing as an environmental citizen. Step two is an issue selection. So students are now practicing that criteria based and democratic decision making to refine and narrow down a single issue for their deeper research and information gathering. So this step ensures that the students are selecting an issue that is excite that they're excited about and it also meets your academic goals. Step three is the policy and practice research and this can take a long time, right? So you wanna uh, think about 
how far you want this to go. So students will conduct that research on their issue, they'll explore policies, they'll explore practices that are related to their issues, and they start questioning and analyzing um, why these things are happening. And, and they'll start to discover some strategies for change. So then that automatically leads into step four, which is goal and strategy selection. Students will continue to use this democratic and criteria-based decision-making to select one policy or practice they wanna change. So they're gonna come across a bunch of them and you wanna just focus on one that they can narrow their focus. And, from, and then they will come up with a, a, an action plan, how they will work together to create an action plan to make this desired change that they want to implement. And as you saw in the video, the girls had a plan and it didn't always um, and it didn't always get the answer that they wanted, but they kept persisting and going. And of course, at the end, you want to have a celebrate, right? And reflect on their successes. So um, so these resources and all these steps um, are, are already done for you. We have um, these tips cards that are student directed. We have a, a quick start that we're gonna share. It's gonna be dropped in the chat. Bianca already dropped it there. So you can hold that and tag that for later. And all these videos and lessons are available for you to go through all six lessons. Um, and so let's go into exactly how this works for the Everglades, right? So I'm gonna turn the, the mic over to Melissa um, in, a, in a second. And, and we want to make sure that you are building that content knowledge first about the Everglades. We have lessons that we already provide in our Everglades Literacy Toolkit, um, but I'm gonna pass it over to Melissa so she can share the lessons that she used from the toolkit and her project. Okay, so we started our project by completing three lessons about the Everglades that are from the K-12 Everglades Literacy Toolkit. Um, we talked about the KOE watershed, we talked about how much water there is to drink, and then we uh, did the lesson about invasive, invasive species, but each lesson was from a different grade level. Um, I chose these lessons because they were suited to my learning objectives, but I were, was able to modify them for my grade level and for my student abilities. So for the last four years, my students have worked with Florida Atlantic University Pine Dog Environmental Education Center, um, and we've grown native endangered orchids right here in my classroom. And while we were growing these orchids, we learned about the Everglades and some reasons why these orchids are endangered. And one threat we learned was invasive species. So as the teacher, my curriculum learning goals included learning more about these non-native and invasive plants. So we began step one by collecting data through inventories that were completed here at school, um, at our students' homes and at big box stores. The kids began to see how many of these plants were growing in our community and they learned about the impacts that these plants were having on the ecosystems. So one thing when you're thinking about doing your inventories, think outside of the box. Think where can I find the data? We got the idea to inventory the big box stores because we saw from our home and school inventories how many Mexican petunia plants were growing around us. And we wondered, where are they coming from? And we realized that you can go to your big box stores and purchase them. So if these invasive plants were being sold there, we wondered what other non-native and invasive plants were being sold there as well. So we contacted scientists in every Florida school and they hooked us up with a scientist who spoke to us about invasive species. Uh, we reached out to the University of Florida to get some pictures, and we did some research to find out what um, the guidelines are for our city, for our county, and for our school district. And as my students learned more about the effects of these invasive and non-native plants right here in our area, they also learned that other people were not aware of how these plants were harming the environment. 
the kids wanted their friends, they wanted their family, other teachers, and the public in general to know that planting or keeping non-native and invasive plants hurt the ecosystem. So they thought an informative brochure would be a good way to get that information to the people. They could read it, they could keep it, and they could even share it electronically. Creating this brochure then became the focus of our civic action project. So all of the information that we had been gathering was used to create this brochure. We used pictures of plants from our school, from our neighborhood, and from the University of Florida. Once we completed our brochure, um, I shared it on my Twitter. We shared it with our school district. We shared it with UFIFAS, with our school, our school families, but the kids really wanted to do more. They really felt like they were not done with this project. We have non-natives and invasive species growing here on our campus and they wanted to rip them out. But of course, because of COVID, we weren't able to do that, um, which we will do this upcoming year. And the kids were really angry that these plants were even growing here at our school. So this year, we will actually be ripping all of the non-native and invasive plants out and replacing them with natives. And we even wrote a grant and got some grant money to do that. This year, I'm also going to be working with an English teacher to help the kids write letters about solutions to this plant issue to our city and to the big box stores. The fact that my kids want to take this project to the next level really, really amazes me. I didn't realize at the time how passionate they were and how they would take to a student directed project. As I said earlier, I'm used to leading them through a project, but this time they led me. And because I teach science, it was easy for me to find those benchmarks and standards to tie those lessons to. But for the English teacher who will be working with me with the kids this year, she's easily um, able to tie this into her curriculum as well. But going back to that practice versus policy lesson, I actually use this for one of my observations. The tips card um, helped create that lesson. And when the AP came in to do the observation, she was really, really impressed with that process. I highly recommend using the cards. Don't reinvent the wheel um, and use them for evaluations. Um, we completed the majority of this project virtually. This year in the classroom, we're gonna be able to do more group work because the kids will be here. I'll be able to monitor them better. And they'll also be able to create portfolios of their work. Um, I'm also gonna have them create more tangible work that they can hang around the room to help remind them of their progress. One of the best parts of this project is the support that you will get from Alicia and from the other teachers who are completing this project. And I know, you know, we're teachers and you think, oh my gosh, I have another meeting that I have to go to every month. Can't they just send it in an email? But you will actually really look forward to them. You realize that there's always someone who understands what you're experiencing. They can offer you help. They can give you an idea or just an ear to hear you out. Um, with the projects, they're not competitions. It's not one school against another. So you can actually be working on the same topic as a teacher at another school in another district, and you guys could actually work together to reach that common goal. The possibilities really are endless. But I wanted to share a quick story to show you how much of an impact this project made on this particular student. Um, he was really, really into this project. I mean, he was my shining star. And one afternoon, the police showed up at his door because the neighbor called them that they saw smoke coming from his backyard. So this particular student went around his yard, ripped out all of the non-native and invasive plants and had a bonfire in his backyard to get rid of them. <laughs> Luckily, his mom and I are on good terms and she knows I told him, you know, never told him to go start a fire, but it definitely reminded me that if you give your chance your students that chance, they really, really will amaze you. Um, and I did see a question on the chat. Did you set aside a specific time during the week for research? We did. 
I incorporated it into my weekly lessons. Great. Thanks, Melissa, for sharing your story. I always laugh about um, the, the, the bonfire story, and I'm sure some educators in the audience might um, identify with some possible students that could do the same thing, but um, it's exciting to learn your story and share that with them. So um, thank you for all of the work that you did during the pilot program. So um, these are the tips cards that she was referring to. She used steps. Um, uh, tips cards eight and nine and these are basically resources that will also be available to you they're amazing because they are written in a way that is um spe specific to a student to understand so the student can read these and know exactly what they are able to do for the next step so how do you get these kids involved so melissa was part of our middle school champions in action pilot program for for year one and we will launch that again for year year two in the fall. So if you're interested in being part of that, let me know and I'll give you my contact information. But if you're a K-5, how does this apply? Well, we have resources that are also available to you and they are, are through our student ambassadors guide. So we have these on our website. We have uh, an action plan template that's already there. We have some resources that are already there for you. Um, if you are a middle school champion and you are trying to, um, or a middle school teacher, and you want to be part of the champions program, we can do that. We can help you be part of that year two pilot. And basically, you have a certain criteria to, to follow with myself and our pilot team. And we'll meet monthly and we'll talk about and we provide you the training and support so that you can effectively implement this program into with your students. So uh, sign me, uh, email me if you're interested in uh, that. And then we also had our high school students. If you have high school students that are interested in doing this and um, through the Everglades Foundation, I keep on highlighting our, our champions, but um, these are programs that Everglades Foundation has offered this year and will be offering, but these resources are available for you no, more, no matter if you're a champion school or not. So our high school student leadership committee also followed the same path of our middle school model um, with these um, civic addressing civic actions. And so we are also accepting um, applications for high school students to work with us directly and, um, and broaden their horizons there, okay? So what can you do in taking the next step? This is kind of our, um, you know, we've talked about taking the next step throughout this entire symposium. So I wanna just to highlight some, like, what can I do? There's so much information. So start with organizing a, a student ambassador team at your school. Um, maybe you're just doing step one of the action plan. That's all you wanted to do to get your feet wet. And that's totally okay. You can look at your curriculum and plan out where you can implement. I know there was a question about what the timing was or how you addressed it. Remember, you want to make sure you're working through. This isn't seen as an additional project, but this is kind of uh, a different way of, in, of reaching your same curriculum goals, but through a civic action project. Uh, you can take the next step, become a K-5 champion school. You can become, take the next step and become a lead teacher for our middle school champion for your two pilot and then you can also invite your students your high school students to apply to become a part of our high school leadership team so here's our contacts um, you can reach us um, Melissa said she would be willing to e answer any of your questions of how she Im impact or you know implemented this in her classroom so you can email her as well as contacting me and then I'm gonna pass it over to um, our, to Bianca to wrap us up. All right, thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Melissa. We really appreciate it. Again, all of the recordings will be available on our website. We've dropped that link in the chat for you a couple of times and you'll get that email. And then we also have our giveaway winner here. So drum roll, please. 
The winner of this session is receiving some water quality kits, and that is going to Andrew Fagerston from Millennia Gardens Elementary. So thank you so much for joining us. We will reach out to you with information on your giveaway prize. Be sure to join us next in the next session, seven, eight, excuse me, session eight, which is the future of the Everglades and closing remarks. So we are going to wrap up this session and jump on over to the next one. So we thank you all for joining us and we will reach out to you with, to some of you who had questions in the chat and make sure that we answer those for you via email. Thanks again, Alicia. Thank you, Mrs. Atkins. We really appreciate your time and we look forward to getting more champion schools for this upcoming school year. Thank you so much.